I've spoken about Joe Rogan a lot on this YouTube channel in the past, not so much lately. And I've spoke at length about my problems with YouTube podcasts. And I've also done videos on like Chris Williamson, former Love Island contestant who now has this podcast that primarily platforms really weird far right people from like the United States or Britain. But then the other day I was just watching YouTube and I got recommended a podcast. I don't remember who it was specifically, but it was like a celebrity or someone interesting, like one of the first men in space or something. And it was on a podcast called like Trigonometry. And then I go on it and nearly every single person they have on this podcast is some sort of alt centrist, right winger or weird person who's pushing like Bitcoin. And then for this video, what I've done is I've researched the podcast ecosystem and I've come to the conclusion that YouTube podcasts are primarily run by Bitcoin centrists, let's call them that, these enlightened centrist types who are simps for Elon Musk, and they mainly platform right-wing people. Not only do they normally platform right-wing people, they also platform the same right-wing people. And some people appear so frequently, they literally must be the most interesting person in the entire world to be interviewed this much in these long-form podcast. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about the podcast scene on YouTube. I want to talk about how it is pretty much as beneficial to the right wing for just boosting these figures who have very problematic, sometimes radical views, and then obviously sending a lot of people down this well-established YouTube pipeline. And then I want to talk about some of the astroturfing behind these podcast figures because a lot of them are funded by Koch Brothers organizations and then I just want to give my general take on these types of podcasts. I'm going to plug my social media and Patreon for about a minute. Skip that if you're not interested. Before we get any further, a lot of my work on this channel is demonetized because when you're covering more serious, sometimes edgier topics, YouTube doesn't like this. So if you've ever enjoyed my work, please consider becoming a patron. And you don't have to pledge a crazy amount. I want to build up my Patreon based on as many people as possible pledging little amounts, like a dollar or two. So if you know you feel like I have ever brought anything that's worthwhile into your life and my content, please really consider becoming a patron to help me continue to do this, regardless of if YouTube monetize or not most of my videos in a given month. Also, if you want to join our communities, come check out our Discord and my subreddit. Those links in the description. And if you want to follow me personally, please check out the Cavernacle at Twitter, at Instagram, and also my personal Reddit where you can keep up to date with all my content and what I'm doing. I usually live stream two times a week. I'm going to get back to the regular schedule next week, hopefully. But all that stuff is archived on the Cavernacle Extra. So if you ever want to watch me talk in a more long form context, longer than 30 minute regular videos, which is already very long, then check that out. Subscribe at the Cavernacle Extra. Now, I guess to start with, I thought I'd outline my own experience with YouTube podcasts. So I want to talk about Primarily Joe Rogan, but also Dave Rubin. So for those of you who don't know, Dave Rubin's Rubin Report channel actually started as part of the Young Turks network. And then when he left, he got to keep the channel. It broke away. And to start with, Dave Rubin would platform people he'd always had on. He'd have people like Jimmy Dore, for example. He'd have people he'd worked with at the Young Turks. And then he kind of branched off. He got people like Larry King and he got people like Stephen Fry, people who are famous for, I guess, not political reasons. And then he slowly devolved into someone who platforms loads of controversial far-right people like Tommy Robinson, Milo Yiannopoulos, and then obviously now he is basically like Fox News light, basically just platforming all these conservative talking heads you get on mainstream media. So I sometimes watched his interviews because I thought they were harmless. He was just getting interesting guests on. But I quickly stopped watching that when he started platforming and sanitizing far right figures and rehabilitating them like Tommy Robinson, for example, who of course I'm more familiar with than the average American who'd be watching that stuff. Um, at the same time, I was watching Joe Rogan. Now, Joe Rogan is good because he has that sort of pull because he was like a child actor and you know, a comedian, but he gets a lot of famous people on. So 
even today you can watch a Joe Rogan interview with someone you like and it's pretty good because you're just getting someone you like talking. So like Quentin Tarantino, I want to listen to that one. The most recent one I remember actually liking was Oliver Stone. There was a really good one with Edward Snowden as well. But for me, I'm a very political person. You know, I'm not going to watch Ben Shapiro. And even if I did, I'm not getting influenced by his ideas. I'm not going to watch three hours of Jordan Peterson or two hours of Dave Rubin and Joe Rogan. I'm pretty much just going to select the ones I want. But a lot of people I've realized are podcast fans in that, They won't just cherry pick some Joe Rogan here and there. They listen to every single episode. I find this really bizarre because of the amount of people he has on. But it is very, very telling. His audience are all like these, like I said, Bitcoin centrists, super into Elon Musk, super into weird fitness stuff. But because of the political slot of Joe Rogan's content, mainly because he platforms right wingers compared to left wing people, a lot of his audience are obviously influenced and people have talked about the Joe Rogan experience as part of his pipeline to more far right ideologies. Now this isn't necessarily his fault in the sense of the YouTube algorithm, but he does platform very controversial people. And this goes to my point about the podcast as a format. The most successful podcasts are civil podcasts, podcasts where you will get a guest on and let them speak and you either not have the capacity to challenge them because you don't have the knowledge on what they're talking about, or you don't want to challenge them because you feel that might affect you getting guests in the future. So essentially what Joe Rogan and many podcasts serve as is just a massive, massive platform to spread whatever beliefs you want, essentially. And that's why these guys, I find them to be quite dangerous in a lot of ways, because especially when you're platforming really awful people, like Ben Shapiro, like Jordan Peterson, like Alex Jones even, then you are influencing a lot of your, I guess, gullible audience, especially if there are people who eat all this stuff up. How many of you have spoken to people and really unexpectedly they like Jordan Peterson or something and you're like, that would never be in your traditional character, but you're talking to me about Jordan Peterson now because you've seen it on Joe Rogan. And I think that goes to a lot of people that people who maybe do not know much about politics or philosophy or economics watch it on Joe Rogan and get easily influenced because they're watching someone talk with authority on these issues that maybe they don't have much experience in. While Joe Rogan is the most popular, and of course, most of his stuff is now on Spotify, you can't listen to these long form podcasts anymore on his channel. He has started this ecosystem, which primarily platforms right wingers. And in this ecosystem, he is by far pretty much the best in that he at least gets more balanced guests on where the ecosystem that he's inspired pretty much exclusively platform right wingers. And I'm going to prove that to you now. So Joe Rogan even recently had a guy called Lex Fridman on, and they're talking about Afghanistan and other things. Now, Joe Rogan also had someone called Yonmi Park, who is a North Korean defector. And you're going to see her pop up a lot as well, because it seems like because all the podcasters are friends, These people just go round the podcast and it becomes such a good grift for anyone who can get on this stuff. So we're gonna go through a lot of these channels and talk about the similar guests that pop up. So Lex Fridman, one month ago, he has a guy called Michael Malison. Now this guy pops up on every single YouTube channel. Like I said at the start, this is the guy I was talking about. This guy must be the most interesting guy ever to speak to because he's platformed so much by so many people. He calls himself an anarchist. He's actually an ANCAP because when I first saw him call himself an anarchist, I was like, oh, maybe they have like one left wing person on. No, he's an ANCAP. So he was on. And then that Yomi Park was also on a month ago. So she keeps popping up. And then, of course, you have people of the intellectual dark web. One month ago, he has Brett Weinstein on. Three months ago, he has Sam Harris on. Four months ago, he has Michael Malice on again with Yaron Brook, who's a libertarian. But also, he has people like GSP on. And I think that's how they often get loads of, you know, normal people involved in this stuff is because, like I said, I got recommended an interview with this Lex Fridman's channel as well. And I was like, that's really interesting. Maybe I'll watch that go on the channel, and then I see, because obviously I'm really into politics, I know these political figures, I see nearly everyone who's featured is a right winger, I do not want to watch this guy's channel. And then Eric Weinstein is also on it, Michael Malice is on it again, Michael Malice is on it another time, 
Joe Rogan is on it as well. These guys appear to be friends. Then you have people like Jack Dorsey coming on it, talking about Yang Gang. And then, of course, you have Richard Dawkins. So a lot of this stuff you can see is New Atheist adjacent as well. So New Atheist, Intellectual Dark Web, and American Conservative. These are the primary guests of these people. Now, if we look at Lex Fridman's Twitter, you can see he's an Elon Musk bro. He was even celebrating this ridiculous morph suit android, writing Tesla AI Day, showed incredible engineering at all levels, AI hardware for interference and training, neural net design, innovation, data tools, auto labeling, and long-term vision for the future of robotics. Here's a quick video I made in the Key Ideas presentation. I'm excited for Tesla AI Day today, Autopilot is one of the most fascinating and impactful real world applications of AI in history. Good luck, Elon Musk. And then talking about being like an alt centrist, the left mocks the right for being dumb. The right mocks the left for being dumb. Maybe let's try empathy and not mockery. Then he also says, please listen to Yomni Park, conversation with Joe Rogan, also Jordan Peterson, it's important. Millions are suffering in silence in North Korea. Again, here is another guy boosting these people because they're all in the same centrist right wing ecosystem. Do I really believe these guys care about North Korea? No, I don't. Another one, I would like to see Bitcoin succeed. Elon Musk, me too. So the Elon Musk Bitcoin to right wing pipeline is alive and well. And I just laugh at all these guys, both simping for a con artist and Elon Musk, while also praising this massive scam that is Bitcoin and praising the people who are the best examples of why Bitcoin is going to fail. People like Elon Musk, who really easily manipulate the cryptocurrency market just through ridiculous memes and Twitter. Now, Michael Malice also has his own podcast channel and, and he talked to that Yonmi Park as well. And he doesn't have as many guests that are the same. But again, this guy just pops up absolutely everywhere. And I feel like it's just one of those guys like Gadsad, who's going to appear, who is literally only prominent for being on other people's podcasts. So if we go to Trigonometry, which is another one, only 260k subscribers, but loads of views. So let's go through their guests as well. So they have Christopher Rufo, this total idiot pushing this war on critical race theory. Clearly a guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I need to make a whole video on that as well. Then a lot of these people also get British right wingers on who pose as more tolerant types. So you have Dan Wooten, who's a famous British journalist who's worked for some of the worst right wing outlets. You also have Michael Malice again. He appears everywhere. Barry Weiss is someone who always appears. She is on this as well. Brett Weinstein, Jordan Peterson as well. Loads of Jordan Peterson. So Trevor Phillips is another Labour right winger who's on here. Also Ben Bradley, who's one of the most unhinged conservative MPs, is featured here, along with Jordan Peterson's daughter. Then you also have Andy No, who often pops up on these podcast channels. And Douglas Murray is another one, part of intellectual dark web adjacent right wingers who seem to feature on every podcast has insanely problematic views about the refugee crisis and Europe and everything a total piece of garbage and then you have Brett Weinstein as well and then you have this other guy and you have another guy called Andrew Doyle who pops up talking about cancel culture all the time and recently even Darren Grimes speaks out on police investigation into him now, Darren Grimes is a literal joke in the UK because there are loads of right-wing grifters and they all form the British version of Fox News called GB News. And he was simping so hard for a job there and they just didn't hire him. Now, if you want some fun, type in Darren Grimes Crafty. Type that in into Twitter and have some fun with the results you're going to find. Douglas Murray featured multiple times and then Gadsad, who I first saw on Dave Rubin and been popularized by Joe Rogan. And of course, you even have Sargon of Akkad. Now, there is someone they got on called Jack Buckby, who is talking about why I joined and left the far right. Find it very ironic, a podcast channel featuring all these awful right-wingers, people like Andy No, Sargon of Akkad, talking about leaving the far right. Like, this podcast isn't literally pushing the far right on people. So, Jordan Peterson has come back 
And he has basically rebranded himself as a podcast channel as well. No longer is he really uploading speeches from lectures or anything like that. He is also now in this right-wing podcast ecosystem. So if you go on his channel, one of the videos from two weeks ago, Bitcoin, the future of money. Loads of people talking about Bitcoin. They all love Bitcoin, these guys. Another one with Andrew Doyle, who was just featured on Trigonometry. Michael Malice popping up again. Literally, must be the most profound mind in the 21st century. Uh, Barry Weiss, two months ago, features on this heavily. Yonmi Park is also there again. Gadsad is there. And you also have Douglas Murray, of course. Now, I've made a whole video on this guy, Chris Williamson, the ex-Love Island contestant. But his channel, you have Yonmi Park on there as well. One day ago, you have Darren Grimes on there too. Michael Knowles, Michael Malice. Michael Knowles featuring again. And then you have, of course, Jordan Peterson is there too. And Sargon of Akkad and Andrew Doyle and Andy No and Michael Malice featuring again. And also Gadsad and also Douglas Murray. So these are multiple podcast channels spanning millions of subscribers, millions of views per episode, but they all seem to platform the exact same people talking about the exact same stuff. Most of these things these guys are talking about are anti-left things. So essentially what these guys are facilitating is loads of people who have extremely problematic views on either trans rights, race, um, immigration, refugees. They're all talking about like the woke war on them, cancel culture. If you listen to these podcasts, you are essentially living in an alternate reality. But because what these podcasts do is mix it up, get scientists in, get people talking about veganism in, maybe some less controversial atheists or people who do philosophy, and you get maybe more normal, naive people in through those means. Like I said, I've been recommended stuff, thought about checking it out before I checked out the channel, looked at the channel, I was turned off. A lot of people will not be turned off because they don't know who these people are. They're either not terminally online or they're not really interested in politics. And then they might start listening to more episodes. And that of course has the potential to radicalize them. And at the very least, if they take them seriously, it's gonna warp their perception of reality to a pretty insane degree. Now it's clear for a lot of people, the podcasting circuit is a massive grift. Most of these people are pushing books. The North Korean defector has said some pretty weird stuff on Twitter that really doesn't sound plausible. And then of course, people like Michael Manners and Gadsad literally seem famous for just being on these big podcasts. But it's something the right wing has always done way better than the left wing. Not saying it's because we're all infighting, but the right wing often cross pollinates its platform. So that's why often these people go on so many different things because it brings their audience over to other people. And that's how the right wing have a bit of a dominance on I guess, YouTube and internet platforms. It's also probably not surprising most of these prominent talking heads are right-wing because being a right-wing grifter is far more profitable than being a left-wing content creator who sticks to their beliefs. Think about how many prominent left-wing people who would even be booked as podcast guests. You know, Joe Rogan, that's why I said he's somewhat better because at least he gets people like Carl Kalinske and David Pakman, who I don't like, and Jimmy Dore, who I don't like at all. But he gets someone on his show. It's not just the Weinsteins, Jordan Peterson, Andy No. although he has done all of that, he at least has a little bit of balance where all these other ones have no balance and they don't care. But because it's like still this civil style podcast, they frame it as they're just, you know, taking in ideas and they're just letting this guy speak. And because it's a friendly conversation, they make the person look infinitely better and more rational because there is no challenge to their views. And that's why this podcast format, in my opinion, especially with the right wing grifters dominating it, is extremely dangerous and problematic. Now I said at the start, and I'm gonna talk about it now, a bit of the funding that goes into a lot of these grifters and how they're able to maintain these YouTube channels and who pays them. Now there's a good article by prospect.org called, we care about faux free speech warriors because the Koch brothers are paying their bills. Now I wanna go into what they're saying because it is pretty interesting, but it mainly focuses on the free speech element of this stuff. So Dave Rubin's influential podcast, The Rubin Report, for example, has a financial partnership with Lean Liberty, a think tank started by the Koch funded Institute for Humane Studies, 
where Charles Koch himself sits on the board, when the Canadian government denied Jordan Peterson's funding for his work, Rebel Media, a group funded with Koch money and headed by Ezra Levant, far-right figure with ties to the Koch network, raised cash for him. Ben Shapiro has collected speaker fees from the Koch-funded Young America's Foundation. Ben Shapiro's sister is also married to a lawyer for that foundation and Turning Point USA, and Brett Weinstein was hosted by the University of Wisconsin's Stout's Free Speech Week, a project of their Center for the Study of Institutions and Innovation, funded by the Charles Koch Foundation. It's not just the intellectual dark web, some of its key popularizers also get Koch funding, Barry Weiss and The Atlantic's Connor Friedersdorf, who's been one of the most visible defenders of Peterson in the media, have both received cash prizes from the Koch-funded Reason Foundation, where David Koch himself sits on the board of trustees. I'm not sure which brother has passed away, so apologize for not creating myself there. And remember the coddling of the American mind? Well, one of its co-authors, Greg Lukianoff, is the head of the campus free speech watchdog, FIRE. The organization is funded, of course, by the Koch brothers. For good measure, the Charles Koch Institute also did a laudatory ride up of his piece. The mission of the free speech movement from its intellectual dark web evangelists to its Koch funders is to advance right-wing ideas, to marginalize those on the left who challenge them, and to mobilize the useful idiots of the center as political cover. It's tempting to dismiss this as, conspir as conspiracy, but the Kochs have left a paper trail of their designs on suppressing speech of any who disagree with them. Documents released last year by George Mason University, a hotbed of libertarian scholarship, show that in exchange for giving millions of dollars to the university, Koch-controlled entities were given influence over academic affairs, including faculty appointments and hires, and even student admission. A similar controversy has emerged years earlier over a Koch Foundation gift to Florida State University, with the Koch brothers estimated to have spent $250 million on more than 500 colleges and universities. It doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to see the impact it could have on suppressing left-wing speech. It's not just the Kochs. FIRE, for example, has also received funding from the right-wing billionaire Olin and Scaife families through the right-wing media sites The Daily Wire and Praga U. The billionaire Wilkes Brothers have helped bankroll the rise of intellectual dark web stars Ben Shapiro and Joe Rogan. In the UK, William Davis has written about how the right-wing promotes his agenda on the, under the guise of free speech in the exact same way. And investigative reporters like The New Yorker's Jane Meyer have shown this isn't just about a couple of billionaires throwing about some money. It's an organized project by an elite class to reserve its power in the face of an existential threat from the left. Now that is really well summed up and puts a more sinister context onto the YouTube podcast scene because sure, a lot of these guys are total grifters. They're total idiots. They have name recognition. So they are put on podcasts like Trigonometry or the Joe Rogan Experience or the Dave Rubin Report or you know Chris Williamson because they see them on other stuff. I get that part of it, but also a lot of these people have funding from Koch brothers linked institutions. And of course they hate the left wing and they're using this enlightened center, free speech war as cover to attack the left wing, whether that is critical race theory, whether that is trans rights, there are two big ones that have been featured a lot, whether that is hysteria about Antifa invented in the minds of centrists and right-wingers. It's all part of the push by libertarian capitalists and far-right capitalists to make sure that left-wing ideas do not get more prominent in America. I always say as a bit of a joke, America is the most cucked by capitalism country on earth, but it's also the country that has so many of these things that I'm talking about, astroturf movements, and even like choosing faculty at universities is dictated by like these organizations. How crazy is that? And the podcast stuff is just another element of that. And they use YouTube and they use the cross-pollination to make sure they can appeal to as many people as possible, get as many audiences together as possible. And what's smart about them is they often just include lots of big celebrities to get you invested in the first place. Now, I don't know how sinister that is on their part. Of course, I'd like to talk to a lot of celebrities and if you know I got the chance to interview them, I would. So maybe it is out of some of their personal interest, but at the end of the day, you can see that most of these YouTube podcasts almost exclusively platform far-right, right-wing figures. And I've shown you the evidence of this stuff and it promotes often the same ones as well. And of course, on this podcast format, this isn't a debate. This is a guy coming on your show to say what he's an expert in 
and you probably won't have the capacity to challenge them even if you want to. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking many of these people would never challenge these people because they want them to come back, because they want to go on their show, and because they want their audience to like them as well. So this is how this right-wing podcast ecosystem has developed with a nice helping of Koch brothers and various other conservative organizations money. So anyway, let me know what you guys think in the comments. Let me know about your experiences with YouTube podcasts. If you want to follow me on social media at The Cavernacle on Twitter and Instagram, come join our communities on Discord and my subreddit. If you want to support my work, look at my Patreon. And if you made it this far, thank you so much for watching.